Today our speaker is Pastor Eric Johns. He is the pastor at the Buffalo Dream Center, and uh, he founded this ministry 18 years ago and has been just used of God, him and his family, in a great way in the city of Buffalo. I had the privilege about a month ago to uh, take my family down there, and we were being part of what they call Adopt the Block program. And what they do is they have this philosophy that it, you don't just knock on your neighbor's door once. You knock on it as many times as you possibly can and build relationships with them and serve their needs. And by doing that, you create a bridge to introduce them to Christ. And so I wanted to be part of that. So my boys and I, we, we went down there and we teamed up. Specifically, I was with Pastor Eric and I got to go to his neighborhood. And I was amazed as he went from house to house. So it was Saturday about 10 o'clock in the morning. And Every time the person opened the door, they would see me and they'd kind of look at me like, what do you want? And then they would see Pastor Eric like, oh, Pastor Eric, good to see you. And he would give them a hug and, and they would have all these different needs. And, and, and some of them were simple needs They're like, hey, Pastor Eric, you got any diapers? My, my kids need diapers. And they were able to possibly help there. And, and we carried gum with us and they, they were just wanted a pack of gum, just a way to, to, to show them Jesus just by giving them a simple pack of gum. And, and, and it was so cool just to see Pastor Eric just know their names and build relationships with them. And they would bring out their kids. One kid, I'll never forget, one little boy, I think he was six or seven years old. And he already had like five or six surgeries and he was going to have another surgery. And, and the mother just came and said, would you just pray with my son and would you pray for us? And there, Pastor Eric and our team, we, we just got to pray with them. And it, it's just incredible when, you, when you're on mission, when you actually do more than come to church on Sunday, right? And you actually say, you know what, only be God, by God's grace did, did, did God choose me to be his child. And not only did he choose me to be his child, but I'm his, his ambassador and I'm his light and I'm the salt. Not because I'm great, but because he's great and he works through me. And there's a whole world with needs. And here is a man who's saying, you know what, I can meet needs. You know, with God's grace. And and with Jesus Christ, I can meet needs. I can serve people's needs and then introduce them to Jesus Christ. And so when I thought, you know, asking the staff and elders, who do we bring in to help us understand what it means to live on mission? Who's doing that? You know, we're focusing on Buffalo and Niagara Falls. Who's, who's living it out loud? And they're like, well, that's, that's Eric Johns, right? And so he's married. Yet they, 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 they have uh, five children, and uh, we're just so thankful that you are here. Thank you so much. Let's welcome him to the pulpit here as he opens up the Word of God. Thanks, Pastor. Praise God. Well, it's great to be here with you today. Amen. We appreciate so much at the, um, at the Dream Center, our partnership, and that's really what it is, a partnership with uh, your church and your pastor and uh, all that you do uh, to come together with us in the city of Buffalo. Let's just, um, if you would, if you got your Bible, turn it to Hebrews chapter 11. And as you turn there, I'm not going to read at it right away, but you can go ahead and find it. And as you turn there, let's um, also pray, if we can do that, and just ask for God's presence. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And Lord, I ask that you would touch hearts. Father, every time I speak, I know that it's not a sermon or a message, or anything that I do that can touch the heart of a person, only you, by your Spirit, can reach down into our hearts and do a work. So Father, it's really never a message that changes a life. It's what we do with it, and how we let you speak to us through that message that does something. So Father, I ask that this Sunday service would not just be another service that goes by, or I would not just be another speaker that is told what a great message, it was encouraging, but you would actually do something in my life today that would change the way I think, that would change the way that I live, that would change me forever. Lord, I believe that you want to do that in our lives every day. So I open up my heart to you and just ask that you'd have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And uh, you could never exhaust it, really. You could spend weeks and weeks going through the different verses and study the people of Hebrews chapter 11. For those of you that are familiar with it, it's often called the great chapter of faith. And it looks at different people who through by their, by their faith did incredible exploits and amazing things for God. And because of their faith, their names are listed 
in Hebrews chapter 11, but not only their names, their accomplishments, their exploits are permanently logged in the Word of God for us to learn from forever. Now, I just want to be honest with you, though, here this morning, that I've heard a lot of speakers talk about Hebrews chapter 11. And many will touch on the first part, but not the last part. Because I honestly think the last part's hard for many preachers to deal with and for us to even understand. Because if you look at the chapter, the end of the chapter doesn't seem to go with the beginning, and they almost seem in conflict with each other. So today, what we're going to do in this service is we're going to tackle it. Are you ready? Amen? We're going to tackle it. We're going to do something uh, that some people uh, don't like to do, and we're going to look at some verses that are a little bit hard to deal with at first, but you'll see as we go. Now, if you're in Hebrews 11, let's just, we're going to just read through some of these verses quickly, just so you get a feel, if you're not familiar with it, of some of the people uh, that Hebrews chapter 11 is listing and what they did by faith. Look at verse 4. It says, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Skip down to verse 5. It says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Skip down to verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Verse 8. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. It just lists all these incredible patriarchs and men and women of God that did amazing exploits by faith. Go, go down to verse um, 20. Let's read a, a few verses here. It says, By faith Isaac, being a blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning on the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave instructions concerning his bones. Verse 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. Verse, on, you know, verse 31, if we skip down to that one, is a favorite verse, uh, to, especially to those at the Buffalo Dream Center because at the Dream Center we've got drug addicts and prostitutes and gangbangers and everybody's just barely saved. How many know what I mean? Amen? And uh, the verse uh, 31, everyone always rejoices over because you've got Moses uh, and David and Enoch and, uh, and Noah. But then verse 31 is Rahab. It says, by faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe, but she received the spies with peace. Verse 32, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Now, you have studied these people. You have learned about these people. Probably most everybody here knows the stories of these great men and women of faith. Yet there's an interesting couple of verses at the end of Hebrews chapter 11 that if you're not sure what they mean, that it might throw you off a little bit. Look at verse 39. It says, and all these, who are the these? Who's the these it's talking about? So about all these people that we just talked about, that we just listed, that did great exploits by faith, all these, what does it say about them? Having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. I don't know about you, but that verse makes, doesn't make sense to me when I first read it. Because I've been taught that it's by faith in God that we receive the promise. Amen? That's how you receive blessing from God. Now here it says that all of these people were people of faith. But it says that they did not receive the promise. Now, if you think that that's confusing, the, the next verse really makes no sense at all. Look at, look at verse 40. It says, God having provided something better for us, that they, don't, don't miss this, look at the end of this verse, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. What does this mean? The author of Hebrews chapter 11 just got done telling us all the incredible things 
that these men and women of God did by their faith. And even though they were, lived by faith and did exploits by faith, and they have a good testimony, they still did not receive a reward. It doesn't seem right that they don't get a reward. But then the answer to it is in verse 40. God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now, I will tell you straight out today, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. As a matter of fact, it amazes me sometimes when we see what God has done through the Dream Center. All I am is a guy that loves people. God told, put us in the middle of the inner city, and I didn't know what I was doing. I was saved when I was 12 years old. I didn't know how to relate to a drug addict, a gang member, an inner city kid, nothing. The only time I ever uh, threw up on beer was when I snuck it from my dad when I was little. You know, <laughs> So I don't have a wild testimony of living that kind of a life. And God put us uh, in the inner city and uh, we're reaching people just because we love people. We're loving people that no one else loves. So I don't claim to be a real smart guy. So what I do once in a while while I'm preaching is I like to throw in some Greek and some Hebrew. Are you ready for some Greek words here today? Amen? That way, uh, that way you'll say, well, he's a smart guy. He knows a couple Greek words. So I'm going to give you a couple of Greek words. And the reason I have to do this today so it is because you won't understand Hebrews 11 and 12 unless you understand the word perfect in verse 40. It says that these great men and women of God did not receive the promise. Why? Because they are not going to be made perfect apart from us. Now, when you think of the word perfect, your definition and my definition is often something without flaw. But the word perfect is better translated in the English complete. They should not be made complete apart from us. Now there's two Greek words that are translated in your English New Testament, perfect or complete. I'm going to give them to you today because now you'll, you'll have a little bit of an understanding of what this verse is talking about. How many are still with me? Amen? Are you still with me? Uh, four of you. Oh, I've lost everyone else. Are you still here? All right. Because I know I'm giving you a lot here at first, but I want you to get this before we can go on. Now there's two Greek words. One is arterios. Everybody say arterios. All right, now the other Greek word is teleos. Say teleos. All right, so it's important to understand which Greek word is used in the verse here, and I'm going to explain them today with this flashlight. Now, our, our family is often around a lot of people, and so when we go on vacation, we like to go camping and get away from people. Amen. And so uh, what, I, <laughs> what I did, you know, raccoons and squirrels and stuff, so, sometimes they're better than people, all right. And uh, so I, I grabbed this flashlight out of our camping gear to illustrate to you uh, teleos and arterios, all right. Now I'm going to do arterios first. This is the Greek word translated complete, arterios. I have right in front of me an incomplete object. When I put it together... I now have a complete object. That complete object is arterios. Now, I'm going to show you the other Greek word, teleos, that is also translated complete in the English, and watch carefully. Don't miss this. Teleos is this. I'm in the process, in the process, in the process. Now I have a completed task. It's different. And the word used in Hebrews 11 verse 40 that they should not be made complete apart from us is the word teleos. So it actually means a task has not been completed. There's a task that has not been finished. I said, Pastor, what are you talking about? What's all this mean? Somebody, somewhere, started doing something. 
And the reason why this group of people in Hebrews chapter 11 has not received the reward is because the task that was started is not finished. It's not done. Nobody can get a reward till it's finished. It's impossible for this group of people in Hebrews chapter 11, no matter how wonderful they are and what they did for God, it's, it's impossible for them to receive a reward because the task is not complete. That's why the Bible says they without us cannot be made complete. Somebody, somewhere, started doing a task and it was passed down to the next generation and they did it and they passed it down to the next generation to the next group of people now most of you know this that the bible was not written with chapters and verses those were all put there a little bit later so that we could easily find things in the scripture now hebrews 12 verse 1 goes right along with the same thought of Hebrews chapter 11. I want you to see this because it'll shine some new light on it for you. Look at Hebrews 12 verse 1. It says, therefore. So we can already tell it's the same thought, can't we? Because of the word therefore. Therefore what? Therefore what? Well, they haven't received their reward because the task is not complete. There's a task out there that's not finished. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The author of Hebrews tells us that these great people did amazing exploits by faith. Then he tells us that they have not received the promise because the task is not complete. Then in Hebrews 12 verse 1, what does he call these people? A great cloud of witnesses. Do you see that? It's the same group of people that was talked about in Hebrews 11. Now they're called a great cloud of witnesses. And we are surrounded by them. So now what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to run our race. Does everybody see that? Amen? We're supposed to run our race. We're supposed to lay aside sin and the weights. I don't want to talk about that part of it today. I want to talk about the race part of it today. Everybody here knows you're not supposed to be living in sin. Amen? (laughs) And I don't want to talk about the sin and the weights. I want to talk today about the race. If you read the Bible the way I read the Bible sometimes, I would read that And the first thought that would come to my mind is, what kind of race am I supposed to be running? What kind? How many know there's many different kinds of races? If this were a 100-yard dash, it had been done. It would be complete. If Moses and Enoch and David and all of these people of Hebrews chapter 11 were running a race that was a marathon. It would still be finished. So what kind of a race is still going on? What kind of a race are we running that has not been complete? This kind. This kind of a race. A relay race. It hasn't been finished. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about somebody, somewhere, back in history, started running a race. And they took the baton of the kingdom of God and they passed it on to the next generation. And then somebody else ran with it and they passed it on. And then the next generation ran with it and passed it on. And we have watched all through history, someone taking it and passing it on to the next generation. That's why I believe in North America especially, a lot of us don't get it. We don't take seriously enough our mission that God has put us on. He said, well, pastor, uh, you know, I don't know if I agree with this. You know, the apostle Paul said that he ran his race and he finished it. Not really, if you study it and look at it. 
The Apostle Paul said, I have finished my course. My course, not my race. Because the race is not over. And the Apostle Paul, he ran a great course. He ran a great lap, but then he passed it on to his spiritual son, Timothy. He passed it on. So all throughout history, we've seen this. Now, for all the guys who are, uh, for all the men that might be taking a snooze right now, wake up, I'm going to talk about ESPN. Amen. Are y'all here, all right? I'm going to talk about sports here for a moment, okay? I'm not a big sports guy. And uh, as a matter of fact, in my church, my, my youth group is all about a foot taller than me and a lot darker than me too, amen. And uh, I don't get in there and play basketball with them or anything. I just, I just watch, but they still love me and I love them. I'm not a big sports guy, but there was this thing that you had to watch on television. You couldn't be there live to see it. You had to watch it on TV to get what I'm about to show you, and it was a relay race. And I don't even remember what two teams were running against each other, but if you know a little bit about track and field, and relay races, you know that when the baton is passed from one runner to the next, they don't stop, hand off the baton, and then go. There's a 10 to 12 yard span where the passing of the baton is practiced over and over and over again because how many know that it doesn't matter how fast you run, if you don't pass the baton right, you're going to lose the race. So it's practiced over and over. And so the runner that has the baton is moving while the, one, the next runner is also moving and the baton is passed. So there's a good flow in the race and the race never stops. Well, on ESPN, there was these two teams running against each other and the first guy took off so fast that even with the first guy having the baton, the announcers were already calling the race one. There's no way that the other team will catch up. This guy's way, way ahead so fast. And that first runner passed the baton off to the second runner and they were just killing the other team. The second runner passed it off to the third runner and by that runner, the announcers were saying they've broken a record, they're gonna win, they're gonna take the gold and there's no way that this other team will ever catch up to them now. The race is over until... The third runner and the fourth runner had a problem. When they went to pass the baton to the last runner, the baton fell on the ground. And the reason why you had to see it on television and not be there live is because you had to see what the cameraman did at that moment. When the baton was dropped, the camera swung over and zeroed in on the first two runners who are sitting on the bench watching the race. See, they couldn't do anything. All they could do was watch. They had, don't miss this, they had already run their course, but the race was not finished. All they could do was watch. All they could do was literally hang their heads in their hands. Folks, how many know we are running a race? Come on, how many know we're running a race? In Buffalo, somebody had jumped up on the stage already and hit me. I'm not used to this quiet. Amen. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, I, I, you know, so it's okay to shout at me. And even if you want, when you guys come up here and slap me or something, it'll make me feel like at home. Amen. I said, how many know we're in a race? Hallelujah. <laughs> we're in a race for the kingdom of God. And the baton has been passed. And this is serious. Because people have died for this. People have laid down their lives for this. And these people from Hebrews chapter 11 are watching us run our race. Why? Because everything they've worked for, everything they've lived for and bled for and died for is in your hands right now. That's why I call this message, Moses needs me. Moses needs me. And my question to you today at Whitehaven Road Baptist Church is this. How's your course going? 
How you doing? Why do you, well, Pastor, what do you, what do you call it? Moses needs me. What a dumb name for a sermon. Why do you call it that? Moses needs me to feed a homeless person. He can't do it. All he can do is watch. Moses needs the volunteers at the Dream Center to get on the bus and drive into the projects and pick up little kids because Moses can't drive the bus. Moses can just, he can, all he can do is watch. He can't go into the home of a family living in poverty and help a single mom. He can't do it. What is Moses doing then? Moses is saying, come on, come on, come on, Eric, do it. Come on, run the race. Come on, Whitehaven Road Baptist. Go, go, go. Because he can't run. He's done it. And the race is not over. And Moses can't get his reward until you run your course. All of a sudden, Hebrews chapter 11 just makes more sense to me. Moses. Start with him. What a lap he ran. How many would like his resume? Amen. I mean, he led people out of Egypt. All the miracles and the plagues and everything that happened. And, and he took the baton and he passed it off to Joshua. What about Abraham? The Bible says that he took off going to a place that he didn't even know where he was going. Willing to sacrifice his son. And he ran the lap and he passed it on. Who were these people? Not just some Sunday school story. These were real people. that really ran a race for God. What about Daniel? Daniel was told, uh, you can't pray to your God for 30 days. Most Christians would have reasoned away how to pray differently for the next month, uh, but Daniel said, I'm gonna open up my window and pray the same way I always prayed every other day. Amen. And he ran a race for God, and he inspired three other guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, in the Old Testament, one of the most brilliant men, I believe, of the Old Testament was Nebuchadnezzar. He had it all figured out. He said, if I can take uh, the, the best kids out of Israel, take them out of their culture, make them eat Babylonian food, make them wear Babylonian clothes, make them listen to Babylonian music, uh, put them in Babylonian schools, uh, then you give me a few years and I'll have them for life. The only mistake he made is he picked the wrong kids. Why? Because they had the baton. They were running for God. Because when they were little, they'd been trained in the word of God and they ran a lap for his kingdom. When I think in the New Testament, I think of Stephen, the first martyr, or John the Baptist. These men gave it all they had. How are you running? How's your lap? How's your course going? The Apostle Paul, he gave his life, he took the baton, and he passed it on. I wonder today who at Whitehaven Road Baptist wants this? Who wants to run the race for God? Let's fast forward through time just a little bit and go to more uh, past the Bible times and in the history and go to Martin Luther. What a laugh he ran! Martin Luther was just a little Catholic monk. He had no desire to start a, a denomination or anything like that. He was just a little Catholic monk that wanted God with all of his heart. And one day God said, Martin, the just shall live by faith. And he took the baton. How many would agree? He ran a great course for the Lord. How many have heard of David Livingston? Have you heard of him? David Livingston. One of the greatest missionaries, possibly the greatest missionary to Africa. He gave his life for the African people. The denomination he was a part of in London, England, thought he was nuts. And that's always the way it is. By the way, Pastor, that's always the way it is. When you're alive, people think you're crazy. When you're dead, you're a hero. Amen. <laughs> and that's how they were with David Livingston. They thought he was crazy. And they said, David, come back to England. Come back to London. We need your ministry in Europe. And you know what he would say? He would say, I cannot come back. My heart is in Africa. Even when his left arm was almost chewed off completely by a lion, he would not come home. He said, my heart is here. 
Do you know how David Livingston died? David Livingston died all alone in a grass hut, in a rainstorm, in the middle of the jungle. You want this? I wonder how many people do. How's your course? How are you running? William Carey. William, before there was a Mother Teresa to India, there was a William Carey. He gave his life for the nation of India. When, when he went there, his five-year-old boy died. His wife went so insane that they had to lock her in a room where she wouldn't hurt other people. And then she died. And people said, are you going to come back home? And Carrie stayed in India and ran the race. Who are these people that are watching you and me? Watching us? David Brainerd. Maybe the name sounds familiar to some of you. He was a missionary to Indians in upstate New York. He died when he was 29 years old. He died from tuberculosis on the mission field. Everybody told him, David, you have to quit. And he would say, I can't. They say, you have to, you have to quit and come home. He said, don't you understand? I can't quit. I'm 39 years old. I'll be 40 next week. And I already have people over the past five years or so telling me, you got to slow down. You're doing too much. You're working too hard. You have to take a break. Uh, and I feel like saying the same thing David Brainerd said. I can't. Don't you understand? I can't. I don't see the devil slowing down. So I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. And people say, well, you have lots of energy, pastor. I don't have any energy. I'm tired all the time. It's true. It's true. And people say, wow, you just got all full of, I'm not full of energy. I've just learned how to live tired. <laughs> Amen. And just keep doing it and doing it. Why? Why? Why are you so serious? Why are you working so hard? Because somebody else died for this. And they put it in my hand. Someone else gave their life for this. And they're watching me run my race. Who are these people? John Bunyan. John Bunyan wrote most of Pilgrim's Progress in Bedford Prison in England. He was 12 years in that prison. At the beginning of his stay in prison, he had a little daughter that came to visit him. As a matter of fact, they sent her into the cell to visit him, and she was blind and real little. She stumbled down into the cell and she said to, to, to John Bunyan, she said, Daddy, they said you could come home today. Bunyan looked at his daughter and said, Really? What do I have to do to get out of here and come home? She said, Daddy, they sent me to tell you if you promise not to preach about Jesus anymore, that you can come out of prison today. Bunyan looked at his little blind daughter and he said, if they let me out of prison today, I will preach Jesus on the streets tomorrow. Do you want this? Do you want it? How's your race? How are you running? Mark Buntain. Mark Buntain's one of my heroes. He lived for 34 years in Calcutta, India, in the slums, in the poorest part of the world. His wife is still alive, and she talked about how she couldn't trust her husband with any money because whenever he left the house with money in his pocket, he'd give it away to someone dying on the street and, and take him off the street and, and help him. And, and any, it didn't matter if he had five bucks or 500 bucks, it was all gone. And he lived in the poorest part of the world. And he built a hospital. And he fed thousands of people every day. He died of a heart attack. On his way to the airport to take one more trip back to America to raise money for the kids in India. Who are these people? And how are you running? I said, Pastor, this doesn't seem right. They gave everything they had and they still didn't get their reward. No, because God had another plan that the task would be completed with you. Hallelujah. 
with me. That the task would be finished with us. All they can do, all these people can do is sit on the sidelines and watch. And listen, one day I'm even going to have to pass this on. But people are watching. The kingdom of God is at stake. You say, Pastor, I don't know. I mean, you're a preacher. This is a this sermon's touching my heart, and you're a great, you're a good preacher, and, and you have a church, and you're, you're different than I am. You know, I got saved when I was 12 years old, and God put us in the middle of the inner city after I got married and out of Bible college. I, I can tell you everything we've ever done at the Dream Center, I had no idea what we were doing when we started. Nothing. Now people invite us in. My wife and I travel literally to different countries of the world and train people to do what we're doing. But when we started, we had no idea. You say, I don't feel qualified. I don't feel trained. Maybe you even sit here today and say, I don't feel worthy. How can I run the race? Can I tell you, those of you that know sports and know relay races know that the last runner in the race is the fastest runner. Isn't that right? And I believe in human history, that's who has the baton. We're the final runners. We're the ones that have to do it. We're the ones that have to get up every day and take this seriously. And I find that there's many, many people in North America, many Christians, they love Jesus, they go to church, but they don't understand that their mission is in front of them every day and they can run with the baton for Jesus every day. You don't have to have a church or a ministry or people know about you per se, but you just have to be able to love people and have a heart for people. There was a little nine-year-old boy going to my church, or not going to my church, actually, a little nine-year-old boy before he went to my church, running the streets of the west side of Buffalo, nine years old, setting cars on fire and mugging people and taking their wallets. Serious. Nine years old. And he's always getting into trouble. In, the, in, in, in Buffalo, the, the, the drugs are often run across the city by gangs using eight, nine, ten-year-old boys. So this little nine-year-old boy was running drugs for the Bloods or the Crips or somebody like that on the west side. And, and I, you know, I walked up to him one day and I said, how would you like to come to our kids club program? It's right over here in this park. And, and I, he told me later, he thought, who's this white guy inviting me to whatever? You know, and he just, he didn't want to come, but he came. And he sat down on a tarp in the middle of the hot summer of Buffalo and listened to the gospel presented in a fun way with squirt guns and snicker bars and all kinds of other things. And then it came time with the message of the gospel and he didn't realize that God loved him that much. And at the age of nine, he gave his life to Jesus on that tarp. By the time he was 10 years old, he'd been coming to my church for a little bit. And he noticed my wife, Michelle, was loading the truck with food every, every week, loading the truck with boxes of food and taking it into neighborhoods, and he would watch her because he lived near where the food pantry was. And, and he came to me one day and he said, Pastor Eric, how come your wife, Miss Michelle, is doing all the food by herself? I said, because she doesn't really have any help. He said, can I volunteer for the food pantry? How many know that 10-year-old boy had more sense than the men in my church, amen? More sense. He and my wife ran our whole food ministry, which today serves over 10,000 meals a month. He and my wife ran it completely together, the two of them, for two years. As he grew up in the church, he, began, he became discipled, and we, he became like my son. See, he grew up in a family with six kids, all different dads, and he had never met his father. His father took off on his mom when she was still pregnant with him. And so one day I remember we, he was about 12 years old and we were driving in the car and we were looking out the window just driving and uh, he said to me, Pastor Eric, I don't know who my dad is. Which I knew, but what do you say? What seemed like an eternity was probably only about 20 seconds, but it seemed like so long because I didn't know what to say and I'm just driving the car he broke the silence and he said, but it doesn't matter because you're my dad. That, 
That's what it's all about. He grew up in the church and he went to, went to Bible college. The first one in his family to go away and to go to Bible college. He came back and he now works full time for the Dream Center. He's 21 years old. He's downstairs right now. He started one of our ministries that you're going to hear about later. Um, at the end of the service, he started a ministry that goes right into people's homes that are living in poverty. And the children are going to be taken away and put into the foster care system because they don't have beds to sleep in or clothes to wear or proper food or refrigerators or washers or dryers or, or pots and pans. And he has successfully started this ministry and we've helped over 120 families stay together. He said, Pastor, somebody fought for me. Now I want to fight for others. There was a little girl, four years old. I remember the first time she came to our church, she ran in the front door. If you come to the Dream Center, you'll see. Sometimes it's utter chaos because we bus in kids from everywhere. 95% of the kids that come to our church don't come with their parents. We bus them in. And so this little four-year-old girl ran down the middle aisle, and my first time seeing her, she took one look at me and jumped up in my arms and fell asleep on my shoulder. <laughs> Every Sunday she did that for six months. I couldn't even lift a hand to worship the Lord or do anything. I held this girl. It didn't matter how hot it was. I'd be sweating, and she'd crinkle my shirt, uh, and she would just rest on me. Her older sister, who was about eight or nine years old, was tough, looked like a boy. Rather than a girl, you couldn't even really tell by looking at her. And she, she would stand right next to me, and she'd tell me, Pastor Eric, my mom says no man in this church is allowed to touch my sister. Put her down. I said, go home and tell your mom it's the pastor, it's okay. I'm holding on to your sister. That little four-year-old girl, come from the east side of Buffalo every Sunday. Those six months, and I didn't know that just before she started coming to our church, she'd been raped by two boys in, her, in the housing projects right on the front porch of her house. She was looking for love, and she came into church, and we loved on her and loved on her and loved on her. My wife started a ministry of birthday cards because no inner city kid gets anything for their birthday. You ask any of them. If you ever have the opportunity, what do you do for your birthday? Nothing. Did your mom cook you a special meal? No. Did you get cake? No. Did you get a present? No. So we decided we're going we're gonna to do birthday cards. You should be at my house at the beginning of every month. There's stacks and stacks of birthday cards. My wife signs every one of them. And I got kids all over the city telling me, thank you for the birthday card. Thank you for the birthday card. Well, one day, Destiny, that little four-year-old girl, came running into church, went up into our children's ministry. There's 100 kids. My wife is about ready to teach. She's getting all her props together and getting ready to teach this room full of kids. And Destiny comes running down the middle aisle and pulling on my wife's shirt. Miss Michelle, Miss Michelle, Miss Michelle. She said, yes, Destiny, it's your birthday. My wife said, it is. How'd you know it was my birthday? She said, doesn't matter. I have a present for you. She said, can it wait? Because I have 100 kids here. Can we do it at the end? No, right now. How many know kids can be like that, you know? And uh, so Destiny reached into her pocket, just like this, trying to find it. And she pulled out of her pocket a crumbled piece of paper. Gave it to my wife. By now, all the kids are watching. My wife looked at this crumbled piece of paper and wondered what kind of a present was that. And she started to unfold it and straighten it out and noticed it was a birthday card. But it wasn't just any birthday card. It was the birthday card my wife gave to Destiny for her birthday. She said, Destiny, this is your birthday card that I gave to you. And Destiny looked at my wife and said, I know but it's the only card I ever got. So it's the only one I have to give you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. How you running? How's your race? How's your mission? Let's stand to our feet. All over this place, 
we're going to pray. We're just going to go to the Lord in prayer, and I'm going to hand it back over to your pastor in just one moment. But if this has touched your heart, we could just cry out to God together. And Father, Father, I take the baton today. Lord, and I realize that I've run the race, Father, but maybe not the best that I can. Or maybe, Lord, I haven't even been running at all. Lord, I'm so in my heart, stirred today to run the race for you. Father, forgive me for not seeing my mission which is in front of me every day because there's a destiny in my neighborhood. There's a Tamain, a little nine-year-old boy who needs a dad in my community. It doesn't have to be overseas. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. But there are needs in front of me every day. Father, help me take the baton and run my race for you. Father, I pray right now all across this place. There's many more young people in this service. Father, I pray for those that are single, for those that still don't know what they're going to do, Lord, with their lives, Lord, that they would consider that even right now you'd move in your heart, by, move in their hearts by your spirit, Father, and show them the importance. Father, we want to know and realize and live in the importance of running this race for you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor Eric, thank you so much for opening the word of God. I can't help but think of in Acts chapter 20, I believe, where Paul says, if only I can finish my race, he says, mm -hmm. the race, the task of testifying the gospel. And that's, that's what our call is. Uh, each of us, I think, are running a race. Amen. The, the question is this, what race are we running? Mm. What baton are we carrying? Mm. And I uh, just want to encourage you guys just to take what he said and, 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 and think with good preaching. I said this earlier. It's only good if it transfers to good living. And, and so take what you heard today and go live it out. Go, go live it out even this afternoon, this evening, all throughout this next week, and, and God will bless it for you. I, I, I told him this in the first verse, I'm going to tell you, and he, he needs to work on his passion, doesn't he? <laughs> My goodness. Let's yeah. give him a hand. God literally used him. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I got to relate to you on, on how, to, how to live tired. My yeah. wife has been gone for three days. Oh, no. And uh, she's, she's in Columbus, Ohio, visiting uh, her sister who just had a new baby. And uh, moms, I take my hat off to you. I, I don't have any more hair to pull out. I'm pulling out high eyebrow hair. And, and, and just, just incredible all that you do. But, you know, that, that's so encouraging to hear how your wife has been involved in, in this ministry with you. And one of the things that I want to talk about and let them listen a little bit is what you guys as a family are going to be doing in September. Um, your, your wife and you have five children, and all seven of you in September are going to India. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that. Yeah, we've been, um, we've been uh, going to India now for uh, about 15 years. And uh, if I can just share, you know, when we do ministry to inner city kids, uh, we could not find, when we first started there, you know there's nothing in the Christian bookstore, no curriculum you can buy for inner city kids that have not heard the gospel. All the curriculum you purchase assumes that these kids have some Bible knowledge. So when we first started reaching out to inner city kids, my wife wrote all of her own curriculum. She's actually been doing that for about 13 years, all of her own stuff. And then we found that the same thing works in India with Hindu kids that have never heard the gospel. And so what we're doing is we're, we've been going to India and doing two things. We've been training pastors, pastors over there don't have training. Sometimes the pastor is the first guy in the village to get saved. Mm -hmm. So he's elected the pastor. And um, so they, they, don't, they need training. They need help. So we, we've gone and we've asked the Indian pastors, what can we do to serve you? How can we help? They said, our pastors need training, number one. So we're training pastors, sometimes five, six, seven hundred at a time. We're doing training sessions and we're teaching them predominantly how to reach children with the gospel. And they're taking these principles and they're getting kids saved in their villages and in their cities. And we're doing large uh, children's outreaches. Uh, what we're going to be doing when we go in September is training pastors and going to villages that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just listen to this statistic. There are 600,000 villages in India. 
500,000 of them have never heard the name of Jesus. A half a million villages don't know who Jesus is at all. If you were to walk up to them and say, have you heard of Jesus? They would say, oh yeah, isn't he the guy selling bananas down the, the street? I think I met him last week. They would have no idea who Jesus is. We're going into these villages and telling them about Jesus, a whole village at a time, and often when the, the whole village responds to the gospel, and then we're taking pastors that we've trained in an eight-month training program, and they're going in and they're planting churches in these villages. Mm. India has more unreached people than any other country of the world. Here's another statistic. 40,000 people in India die every day who have not heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing, because we hear the gospel all the time, all week long, and there's people that have never heard it. So what our family's doing, all seven of us are going. My two oldest girls uh, are going to do some of their own villages. Uh, my wife and I, some nights we'll do three villages a night. We'll split up, and we're going to go and try to hit 30 to 40 villages, and we're going to plant churches in those villages and train pastors how to reach children with the gospel. So we're really excited about and it. And it's so cool because talking to Eric and learning a little bit, he had... Uh, I believe one individual took care of their entire airfare for yep. their entire family. Imagine flying out your whole family to India and then being there for an entire month. The cost is pretty significant, um, but th those, those costs have been covered. Here, here's how we can help. You would not believe the cost to present the gospel to one village. Tell us about that. We can reach an entire village for $200. The, and all that, all that means is we go into the village about 10 o'clock at night after all the people have come in from working in the fields. We build a stage and with a sound system and some lights, we present the gospel. Now, if you have no television and no radio and some little white guy comes to your village, <laughs> how many know you're going to go see what it's all about? <laughs> Amen. And really, and really it's funny, but that's really what the Indian pastors told us. If you will come and do village meetings, we can reach people for Christ because most Americans aren't willing to go on a five or six hour drive into the jungle and reach a village. But that's what my wife and I love to do. We love it. So we're good. we go and for $200, the village might be 300 people, 400 people, as many as 1,200 people in a village and they'll all come. The men, the women, the kids. Can I tell you almost 100% of the village will give their lives to Jesus every time we present the gospel and we'll plant a church. So it's not just doing something that we're going to put in a newsletter. It's something that's going to have lasting fruit too because we're putting a pastor and his family there that are going to take care of that village. Explain real quickly why 100% come to Christ because of the Hinduism and, and yep. the fear that they have. Talk yeah, about a, a Hindu will worship 3,000 gods from a rock to a snake to a monkey. They'll worship everything. And everything in Hinduism is based on fear. You know, you give an offering or you give a sacrifice to a God so that they won't hurt you, so that you'll be safe and they, they won't pour out their wrath on you. So a loving God who sent his son to die for them is a com it's just completely unheard of. And so when we present the gospel in Jesus Christ, they are ready to receive the That's good awesome. news of, of the gospel. It's an awesome thing. So $200, think about this, $200 reaches one village. How many villages are you hoping to reach in that 30-day span? I'm hoping, to, I'm hoping 30 to 40 villages somewhere in that, okay. in that area. Amen. So, so I think this is where we can partner with Eric. He's getting ready to leave here in September, and, and all their, their personal finances for their personal trip is covered, but they're yep. trying to raise support for reaching specifically villages. $200 a village. Some of us could take care of that. You know, you can make it a family project. You could do a couple of villages. But we're going to give you an opportunity, even today, to give towards that. If you want to partner with that, take out one of those envelopes in the pew rack ahead of you. Mark on there, Pastor Eric Johns, India. And we'll know that that money is designated to go specifically to that trip. If you're like me, some of you are like, man, that sounds like an awesome thing that I want to partner with. But you didn't let me know. Why not? Well, we're going to do it next week as well. So there you go. We're letting you know. <laughs> Come next week prepared as well. And just, again, use the envelopes in the pew rack. Designate that portion of the offering, and it'll go directly to them. And how cool would it be to think this way, that by giving 200 bucks, you're going to reach an entire village, 300 to 1,200 people 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our job is to plant seeds. Here is our seed planter going on our behalf. Praise the Lord that we can partner with him and, and reach the, the, the country of India. So uh, that's one opportunity we want to talk to you about. The other opportunity is really for parents and our children. We're doing this thing that he wants to talk about. You, you know that gentleman that, that said, hey, you're, you're my dad, that, he, that he, he led to the Lord and trained. He's downstairs. Some of you saw him. But they got an incredible backpack ministry that they're going to be doing in September. I thought this is another way that we as families and as a church can help. Tell us quickly about that. All right, a lot of the families that we minister to through Project Prevention are, uh, that are living in poverty, they have all kinds of needs. But one of the biggest needs is when their kids go back to school. Uh, and some of you parents know, you get a list of all the things your kids need and you go to Walmart and spend all kinds of money on uh, material for back to school supplies. But imagine being a family here, a mom with four or five kids, and you just got here from Burma, and you lived in a refugee camp for 10 years. And now you're on the east side of Buffalo and you don't even have a couch to sit on or proper clothes to put on your kids. And now they're going to school and coming back and saying, we need all these school supplies. So what we wanna do with these kids is we wanna go into every one of our project prevention homes and give those kids a backpack with school supplies. It's a, it's a great way to meet the need. I was telling a family after the first service, they said, well, we wanna be involved uh, with that. It's a great way to reach many of the Muslims in our community. Um, half of our project prevention families are refugees, and many of them are Muslim people. And can I tell you, we are going into their homes. Now we're presenting the gospel. We are praying with these families because we're going in and we're just meeting a need that they have. And so we want to put backpacks into the hands of, in the hands of these kids. And if you guys could partner with us, that'd be awesome. Your kids, right now, as they're leaving their children's ministry, are getting a half piece of paper explaining all the details of it. But what you need to know is the backpack will just have common school supplies, not used, brand new stuff, okay? Not the kid's backpack that your kid doesn't want from last year. We're talking new stuff, new pencils, new scissors. But we need it here at our church by August 21st. We'll take all the backpacks, we'll take it to the Dream Center, and some of us hopefully will be able to help distribute that through all the different families there. But this is just two practical ways that we can be on mission, helping Eric and partnering together as we go forward. Now here's the deal, okay? I said this for the first week, we don't pay somebody to do it for us, right? We, we partner with them as they're doing it, and we do it where God has planted us, amen? So God's planted us here, he's planted us in this area, he's planted your place of employment, so that we carry that baton and live on mission. Pastor Eric, I'm so grateful that you are here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Let's thank give him you. another hand for being here with us. We can have a seat there. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come forward and we'll take a, a time of offering right now. And let's just have a, a word of prayer. And again, uh, you can give towards uh, the, 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 the ministry of Pastor Eric. Again, it just designate that on the, on the piece of paper there or the envelope, market, Pastor Eric. Otherwise, it'll go into our general offering. And I uh, just want to encourage you to partner in that as well. So let's pray. Ask God's blessing. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we have again to be here. And Lord, what a challenge from your word there in Hebrews 11, specifically verse 40. What, a, what an incredible picture of thinking that Moses and David and all these people who we call heroes of faith have run a lap of the race and now it's up to us. They've handed the baton to us, the baton of carrying your gospel going forward. And Lord, we don't want to drop the baton. We don't want to quit our race. We don't want to live our life in a different world, living, running a different race. God, we want to run the race that you have set before us. And Lord, may we be like Paul. May we press towards that mark of Christ-likeness. May we look at people through your eyes. May we see the people and the needs that they have. And may we be the ones to take the gospel to them. And we'll just praise you for that. Thank you for Pastor Eric. Thank you for the Dream Center. Use them in a mighty way in Buffalo. Use them in September in a mighty way in India. And God, may you be blessed. May you be honored. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray.